Welcome everybody to episode four of Divergence, a youth project that aims to dive into the lives and work of the people who make a difference in the world, the Divergence. My name is Preston and with me are my brothers Perrin and Philip. Along with us, we also have Alir and Sam Akesa. Today's guest is an amazing volunteer and visionary from the Philippines. Volunteer and visionary. All right, I like that, I like that. All right. Go on, go on. No. That's right. We're excited to welcome Jordan Sebastian, founder of Courageous Compassion. For years, he has been helping with the disasters in the Philippines, providing sustainable solutions for the victims of typhoon and hurricanes. Hello, Mr. Sebastian. How are you doing? Hey, Sam. Just call me Jordan. Okay. It's shorter. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Uh, we know you are very busy and we really appreciate it. I believe Philips want to ask you a question. Yeah. Go, Philip. Can you introduce yourself a little bit more to the people watching this video? I'm sure they're like, very curious about a person with such a diverse career. I heard that you even direct movies. You've been involved in so many creative and innovative things. Which one would would you say is your favorite thing to do? Wow. My favorite thing of all the things that I do is writing. Um, I love to write. And I think those are my va most valuable assets. I come up with very, very valuable assets when I write. You've heard that you've also survived Typhoon Odette. Can you tell us more about your experience? Of the, of the event, of the incident of Odette. What happened in Odette? Ababa. Okay. Whew. Ooh. All right. Um, how long do we have? We're this is like free flowing, like free flow. Huh? This is this is got this is free, this is free flow, flowing. Free flowing. All right, all right, all right, all right. So I have to start with me as a filmmaker. All right, you all know I'm a filmmaker, right? So before I did the last one, which was the art of being lost or the art of courtship, um, I produced a film called Jose Rizal, The First Hero. And it came out, I don't know if it's still coming out, in History Channel in Asia. So in the entire Asia, we were screening um, because that is not the first hero. While that's happening, we were also screening uh, all over Europe. And then in Japan, I mean, not all over Europe, like three countries in Europe. <laughs> but, you know, kind of like spread all over. So we had one in, in Spain, one in France, and then several in Belgium. Yeah, and then we also had screenings in Tokyo, in also locally all over schools in Iloilo, in Bacol, and I think a little bit of Bacolod. So I learned so much from that documentary. I can't believe that you were able to screen that movie so in so many places around the world. It's just really amazing. Yeah, and the thing about it is, what's more amazing is. They were paying me to do it, you know, go all over the world. <laughs> I was being paid to go all over the world and be, what do you call this, uh, be invited to all these places. And there were times that, you know, it was like cowboy, I'd sleep in a family's house, but I don't actually mind sleeping in a family's house. You get? So, but there are times also I'd want to sleep in a hotel, siempre, di ba? Uh, bye -bye. Like sometimes you want to be in a place where there's a lot of people. So it may be an experience in Europe. And I felt I, I also experienced what Jose Rizal experienced. 
You know who said is that no? You're familiar with him, no? Yes, we are. All right. Yes. So so he's known to go all over the world. So I, I was there was even a point, there was even this point where I had no money left and there I had no I had no international calls. People couldn't reach me. And I was stuck in Belgium. And I had I landed in an airport where there was no Asian, all white people in the cold, and I had no money. I just found myself that way. And I had to get to Brussels Airport to catch my flight back to Manila. If I'm so I'm here in this faraway province, and I have to get here in a span of 12 hours. If I don't get there, I won't reach my flight home. And I don't have any money and no phone. And it was a Sunday. So everything wasn't going for me. All right. And then so I was asking for the police, could you give me some, can you lend me some money? Not, not beg, but lend me some money so that I can get a bus to go to my to my flight, not a single person would lend me the money because I looked like an alien. I looked like an alien. I was like this Chinese, Mexican, Colombian looking uh, small guy, you know, with the hat of Jose Rizal. I was wearing the top hat of Jose Rizal in the movie. So I was in Europe, you know, with a cap of Cerizal, but with a very cool, you know, French coat, you know. It's Europe after all, you know. So I was there and nobody was going to give me. So I said, man, I'm just going to walk. I mean, I can't, you know, be self-pity and all of that. So I started to walk outside of the airport. It was cold, you know, as an Asian, you know, not used to the cold. <laughs> It was cold, and I was carrying my luggage. <laughs> I was carrying my luggage, and then I wrote. Uh, I said, "If you're," I went to the police and I told them, "If you're not gonna lend me money, at least lend me a marker, a marker, you know, marker like where you write things, big pencil pen. We call it the pencil pen here." So I asked for a pencil pen, and then they lent me a pencil pen. They didn't offer any paper. And I took out a certificate given by the Belgian, Philippine Belgian Embassy, a certificate of appreciation for creating a film, Jose Rizal documentary, and for coming over and explaining the film. They gave me an appreciation, you know, certificate of appreciation. I took the certificate of appreciation and I wrote at the back, Brussels Airport. All right. So I went outside the highway and, you know, I, I was hitching a ride. And I got that ride. Bottom line, I ended up in Brussels airport. The guy was going to Brussels airport. So anyway, long story short, I experienced Jose Rizal, a little bit of what Jose Rizal went through. And I come home, Yolanda is, happens, Typhoon Haiyan. So Typhoon Haiyan was the strongest storm surge, the strongest storm that ever hit the planet. At that time and it ravaged the whole eastern western uh late Takroban, really devastated like you know imagine the avengers and the transformers fighting bang, in an island in this archipelago bang. that's what it looked like and more more devastation so anyway so many died and all of that and as you know Partly 
you know, having experienced everything that I've experienced and researched about the Serizal, I was compelled. Everybody say compelled. 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 Compel. I was compelled to help the people that lost their homes. I was compelled. I need, I was need, there was a need inside of me that I had to help the people. You get? Yeah. So the problem during that time was there were like areas where for several days they haven't gotten any relief goods, but they were devastated. And whew, I'm remembering so many things now. You know that this is the first time I'm going to be interviewed in in depth like this, and I'm where I'm really gonna tell everything. I'm gonna tell everything. Is, this is free flowing. To be honest with you, starting from the story in Belgium, it kind of sounded like a literal right. that we yeah, that yeah. we could make in the future. Yeah, we can, we can. And uh, then, when actually, did Yolanda happen? Yolanda happened. You gotta Google that boy. You find that out, not me. My memory is already in the past. I'm creating new memories. 2013. Damn, I remember. 19. 2013. 13? 2013. All right. November 11. Man, I can't believe. I can't Actually, imagine how you would feel like you just went from having all that trouble in Belgium and then you go home and then it feels like there's literally no difference. In no, hindi the naman, hindi naman yun, hindi naman yun actual, like the next day, you know, you know, it's just like my time is like sometimes a day feels like a year. You get in, in Yolanda how? happened in 2013. That's the same year I was born. Wow. What, what's your birthday? February Month. 25, 2013. All right. So, wow. So, yeah. So, while well, you were around six months old, Yolanda happens. And it, it was the greatest storm in the whole of history, in the entire planet. All right. So, so many people died. And it was under underreported. They only said it was like... 10, less than 10,000 when in fact I think I believe in my heart it was more than 100,000 that died in a storm so, so so what happened was people in social media they were helping I did my part I donated some things and everything you know posted on Instagram and then, but after being you know with Yolanda uh, with, with Jose Rizal and everything knowing and understanding what Jose Rizal really was about in my perspective, just giving and then taking a picture of me giving water bottles and t-shirts and whatever, food and goods, the picture, it was enough. It wasn't enough for me. I needed to do more. And also because, you know, I was like in between the things that I really wanted to do. I was really lost. I really didn't know what to do after the documentary. You get? So, where are we now? Sorry, my mind is so tired already. But this is refreshing. So, uh, a picture comes out. A picture comes out. Go to, um, well, a picture comes out in social media. I actually, no, no. I, I saw a picture of an airdrop, a plain airdrop. Can you imagine an airdrop? Yeah, like, I'm, I'm very familiar. Yeah. All right, you know, with the games, you know, throwing stuff and then parachutes <laughs> and stuff. Like that. All right. So I saw a picture of an open, open door. Of an airplane while it was flying, and then I think some someone was throwing stuff, right? So I posted that, and I said, "Why can't we do this for those that have not gotten any relief goods? 
Why can't we not do this for them? And then somebody said, then there was an argument, argument, because like this, like that, like that, like this, like that, like that. And then somebody just said, why don't you do it, Jordan? You brought up the idea. Do it. So I said, all right, I'll do it. So I, so I did it. Um, at the end of it all, together with a group, together, I would have said I've impacted 50 to 100 barangays in areas that not even the military can enter. I was able to give relief goods to Filipinos in their most desperate need. So that was the first initiative that I did after my European tour. Uh, and then because of that, I mean, I, imagine, imagine there was an incident where the police, the military, the Catholic Church, uh, the mayors could not enter a barangay because it is made up of communist rebels. Right? So there are communist rebels there that was also hit by the storm. It was hit by the storm. Right? But the military, the government, the church couldn't give to them because they were not of the same faith or they are not, quote-unquote, part of the government. So I said, okay, that's where I'll go. So I crowdfunded, I crowdfunded, we crowdfunded the whole operation. And given that, I realized these are Filipinos also. These are people also, even if they're not part of the government, even if they're not of the same faith, we still need to help them. So that's where we were able to distribute. So, and then I was in, I got to be invited to um, Tacloban a month after the storm hit, and I was thinking in my mind, oh, Tacloban's fixed because everybody went there. Justin Bieber went there. The guy in this adult TV, I mean, grown-up TV shows, like um, Suits, the actors there. So all the media, Anderson Cooper, CNN was in Tacloban. They all went to Tacloban. So I thought after a month, Everything's like getting fixed. Everything's moving. People are building, you know, jobs are being created and everything, 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 everything. But when I got there, everything was still in shambles. Everything was still in shambles. People were still not getting the right amount of aid and need that they needed. I stayed away from Takloba because, you know, everybody was there. But when I got there, Nothing was happening after one month. Everybody left, I guess. I mean, not everybody, but, you know, or there was corruption. I don't know. Bottom line, I asked the survivors, what do you need? What do you need? How can we help? How can I help? How can my family help? How can my friends help? They said, we need jobs, sir. We need jobs, sir. The survivors are telling me. We need jobs. Because if you give us jobs, we'll be able to buy our own food. If you give us jobs right away, we won't have to, we can build our own homes. We can take care of our own children. You don't need to keep on giving us, giving us ayuda, help, help, aid, aid. You don't need to if you give us jobs. That's all we need. But this is still a broken city. Huh? No electricity, so much electricity. Things were still in the known. People had no houses and everything and everything. So I said, all right. All right, let's make, let's make jobs. So I asked them, what, what, can we, what can we sell? What do you guys need? What's important here? And he said, sir, sir, Bags. 
We need bags, especially for children. Because they lost everything. They don't have bags. And then their clothes, people would give them clothes, but they don't know where to carry it in. You know, carry it, because sometimes they have to go, they have to leave. They're just holding it because they didn't have bags. So that's when we came up with the idea. And there's so much trash. So that's when we came up with the idea that we make upcycled backpacks made by survivors in a disaster zone. And the, the, that idea was that idea was very radical in its time because social enterprises or sustainable businesses weren't still the popular thing back then. I mean, even up to now, you know. Um, so, and to set up something like that, that's high risk, but high impact, to set it up in a disaster zone, a post-disaster zone, PDZ, post-disaster zone. Everybody say post-disaster zone. Post-disaster post zone. zone. Right. So imagine, huh? I mean, I'll just get you back. Avengers, Transformers, fighting in an island. We wanted to make backpacks. So how do you do it? How do you do it? I got the best bag makers. We made the prototype, a sample of the bag. And then I told the whole world, I'm going to, I'm selling this backpack for $100. But I can only give it to you in one year. Why one year? Why one year? Because I'm still going to teach the survivors how to make them. <laughs> so you can't get it now because we're still going to set up the factory that will make the bugs. You get? So it's not yet there. It's a post-disaster zone. So, and then they bought people all over the world. I think numbering uh, like 20 countries. Ordered the backpack. Did you guys get one? No, do you have one? No. Um, I don't think I have one at the moment, but I do remember. I think I remember. I remember we have it. Well. We have one. Yeah. Oh, we okay. have, we have one or two. Is it still one. there? Is it still there so that people yeah. can yeah. understand? What I can doing? get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it. Show it. Because I remember it. like visiting yes, your your, your, like, your, your place. Yes, no, your yes. Place the picture then... exactly. The picture. Can can we show the picture to the people? Yeah, and we're just gonna we're just gonna. Uh, Flash the picture here. So, so that's the bag. And then open it, open it, open it. Oh my gosh, open. I missed that bag. That's a cool bag. There you go, boom. Inner that's jeans. Tarpaulin, right? Yeah. So the hype is inside and outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that thing, that bag, is called compassion. All right, that's compassion. That baby right there. You know that you you don't ever have to throw that bag, and you can like keep on using it. If it gets broken, you can give it back to us, ship it, and let's come up with a deal. I'll send it back. You know, that kind of thing. You get that can be done. And anyway. Anyway, so where were we? Um, so that's the club. So, so I, we built a facility. We trained the survivors. They have lifelong skills that they can, you know, lean on for the rest of their lives. They had income. They had money for their food. They made backpacks. And then we delivered the backpacks after one year. Okay, is that too complicated, my story? No, no, man. No, it was a very... I like this story, but... Okay, what was your question? Let's go back to the question. Sorry, you know, I have you know, very flying thoughts. The question was... The... Uh, ah, Odette, 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 Odette,
So, after Tacloban happens, after mga three years, five years, things got expensive in Tacloban. And I got tired. Really tired. And I became sad. I became lost. I became confused. After helping for three to five years. So, I made a film during that time. I made the film called The Art of Ligao. Okay, The Art of Ligao. Ligao means in English, being lost or courtship. You understand courtship when you know you ask your wooing woman. All right. So that's, I, I made that film. I went back to my passion, right? But when I made my film, I realized that I'm not just satisfied with my passion. I, as Jordan, need to operate with compassion. I'll say that again for emphasis. I realized that passion was not enough after making my film. The art of being lost. The art of courtship. The art of Wu. See, that's a better title. The art of Wu. Right. So, yeah, that's a better title. Because I'm still making the translation for the film in English. It was done in Tagalog and Bisaya. So anyway, after doing that, I realized I still I was still looking for something more. And in a way, having gone through, you know, Yolanda, Hayan, Tacloban, everything's destroyed, and so many things are happening in the world, I was already looking for a very safe, distant island. Okay, so I... I got one of the survivors, Jimaline. That's when you met studio. Created a lot of prototypes, designs, you know, studied things. And then we went. And then at about that time, things were getting crazy. Or I felt already crazy coming in. You get what I'm saying? Like, I kind of knew or felt that Crazy is coming in. So I was looking already for a safe space. So, and I also ended up agreeing to going to an island to do a documentary. To do a documentary. Which I did. I agreed. And at the same time, I was staying there. Okay, this is a safe space. You know, when quote unquote uh, shit hits the fan. This is a safe space. And then President Rodrigo Duterte announces that there's going to be a lockdown, a nationwide lockdown because all the other countries were doing national, nationwide, global lockdown. All right, all right. And that was announced March... 15, 2020. The lockdown will happen March 20, 2020. Right? Do I go back to where my wife and my child was? Or do I bring tell them to come to the Nagat Islands back again? Because they already came. My, my, my wife already came. So I told them to come to the Nagat Islands because nobody knew what the vaccine was all about. Uh, the, the vaccine, the virus was all about, and there was still no talk of any vaccine. A vaccine. 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 So I kind of knew that it was going to be more than one year. 
which I actually told my wife. That's why she agreed. And so being there, there was the lockdown also happened in the island. I had so much time to think, play, meditate. And then after a year, when we kind of understood already what the virus was, I asked my wife and my child because internet is really slow there. So my wife, I had my daughter was having a hard time with the online schooling in an island with bad internet. So they went back to Manila. So I stay in the island, still locked down, went back to lockdown. And my whole team in the island, our team, I'm part of their team, we decided to plant coconuts in a post-mining site. Do you understand post-mining site? So I need to explain. Huh? Yeah. So we planted in total during the lockdown and even before the lockdown, in total, majority after, uh, during the lockdown, 10,000 coconut trees in a 10 hectare land. All right? So we were planting coconut trees, planting during the lockdown. Everybody was in their homes and everything. Ah, we were enjoying the mountain, you know, exercise. At the same time, you knew you were doing good because you were already planting in a post-mining, you know, uh, site. So we were doing so much good and the air was good and there was no virus anywhere. You know? We ended up with, you know, planting so much. We, it was part of a cooperative. It's part of the NGO, Courageous Compassion. We created a cooperative with farmers and that helped them, you know, earn more, hopefully. No, they were already earning more when everything was happening. We were already helping like around five, five farmer associations, you know. And then we were growing in numbers. I... I set up a school where the students were getting paid, basically. A school where the students were getting paid to learn, right? But while they were learning, we were also producing for clients already. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Students online. Lockdown, producing, and then studying at the same time. That's what they were doing. And then we set up a, no, a news channel because there wasn't any local news channel. So we came up with a news channel composed of also the students, young people, online students. So, so. And then I just finished shooting a short film with locals with zero experience of filmmaking or shooting a short film or a you know, decent video for that, a professional video. No experience. We just finished shooting a short film. Bam! Then Odette happens. Odette happens. Or the warning for Odette comes. Category 5. Storm. When was this for? When, when was the yes. warning? The, the storm came at, the, at 16. We already knew about it around 10. So November... Oh, November. November, ba? Or December? De December, no? December 10, around that time, or... I don't know, but I, but I knew we had time to prepare. We had time to think about it. We had time to ignore it. Nobody was really taking it seriously except one guy. In my group, that is. Only one guy. Our friend, who's part of our team, who was a survivor of Haiyan. He was a survivor of Haiyan. And now,
Mindanao. In the Nagat Islands, that's receiving a Category 5 storm warning. Oh no, my connection is unstable. We're good? We're still good? All right. And I'm watching him. The guy is concerned. But now you're thinking, is he concerned? Because there's something to be concerned about. That's already me, huh? one of the critical thinkers there. Or is, it, is he just paranoid? Because he has trauma from the storm. That's what I was thinking. Two things. It's a good thing. I kind of listened to him. That I, that I also prepared. We had live straw. I had two go bags. And then I knew my, my team, my community, my people. We had, we had gen sets, we had fuel, we had food, we had water. And our house was cement. At the same time, in quarters where I stay, I sealed the windows, I sealed the doors with tape, you know, so that no wind could come in. And then I laid down. And then I took a nap during the storm. And then, so I kind of woke up when the storm was ending, you know, and then I went out. It was the eye of the storm. You understand the eye of the storm? All right. It was the eye of the storm. There was peace. There was calm. But everything was already partially destroyed. Everything around us, everything. Because we had like two floors and we could see everything and everything was, just, you know, partially destroyed. There was still hope. There was still a no. So some of the people in my team, they started to clean. They started to clean already. Not realizing that this is just the eye of the storm. There's more to come. In fact, the stronger part of the storm is still just about to hit us. And you're cleaning? You do not understand the storm. Right? They had no fundamental understanding of a category 5 storm. And why not? It's not being taught. There's no video to explain what a category 5 storm is that is interesting enough or compelling enough to make you realize that when you hear about a Category 5 storm, you have to take it seriously. You honestly really do need more people to teach those kind of things. Yes. So that when, when those warnings come, yes, and the government exactly. use government words, the, and mm -hmm. it's a kind of 15-letter long acronym. Yeah, it's so hard. That uh, that's easy to understand, or at least yeah. an acronym that, that sound that spells a word that's easy to understand. For example, run. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is a category run. Right? No, no. So, um, yeah. So, what happened was people were not so when the storm got back again. I told I told them, guys, go back. You know, go to your safe spaces. Go back because it's just the eye of the storm. So they went back. I went back to my room. And then when the storm came raging in, the winds, the water, punching, cement houses, bahay kubos, you know, wooden houses, barangay halls, basketball courts, you know, raging. I was sleeping. Like a baby. Did you have a good nap? I it was a sleep, brother. It was a sleep. It was a good sleep. It wasn't a nap. It was a full blown sleep because I knew after that day, after the storm ends, I wouldn't be able to sleep for the next seven days. I already had in my mind how strong it would be, so I needed to rest. True enough. After the storm. I did not sleep 
for the next seven days. That's my answer to your question, Alira. Sorry if it took so long. You are like touching something that is very important to me. So people, it is a, a very interesting story. Okay, especially the part where you ha- where you wrote um on your certificate of appreciation. <laughs> yung ano yung sorry sa no it, I, actually that's a there's a long story to that. I just had to shorten it. My Jose Rizal experience there. So here's the thing. Did you know this is like gonna be like a series of trivia? Did you know? that there were more Europeans watching my than Filipinos. Maybe it's because less Europeans know about Jose Rizal. No, That's no, why they're no. like more interested. No, 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 no. Because there are what I call Knights of Rizal members, foreigners, and all of these members, they wanted to watch it. The Filipinos, eh, but the Europeans, oh my gosh, what is this? So that's why they brought it there. And then, so anyway, I was going to all these screenings. I was going to all these screenings. I, I realized the Jose Rizal has a monument in all the places that he wrote about and stayed. You get? He has a monument. The guy has a monument in Brussels, in Spain, in Germany. He has plaques in, in China, in Japan. Oh, no, no, sorry. Macau or something. For sure, Hong Kong. For sure, Hong Kong. He has a plaque. He has a Luneta Park. We have a Luneta Park alike, like the statue of Jose Rizal somewhere in Germany. And I was going to all these screenings, and they were like so proud of what we were doing. And but I ended up in Brussels, in a, a province in Belgium, a very isolated place in Belgium, so far away from Brussels city, and nobody would lend me money. So I ended up hitching. What stopped was this cool Mini Cooper, not the Mini Cooper small one, but the Mini Cooper with uh, the Cooper with a bigger like country. Uh, a medium Cooper. Medium yeah, yeah. Cooper. Yeah, medium Cooper. So the, a, a foreigner comes out. So I'm here in my trench coat, my hat, my luggage, bring my luggage and everything. And then this, this Cooper stops, gets out. He says, hey, I'm coming. I'm going to Brussels airport. Come on, ride with me. So I put my bag there in his car and then we, we drive. He ends up being some sort of in my mind, because he told me exactly what it was, but something like a uh, engineer for the military or something, or for an uh, airline, I don't know, but something that big, who happens to also be a theater actor. He plays Geppetto in Pinocchio, all right? I don't know if you know that. We're, I'm very aware of um, Pinocchio. All right, so he plays Gepetto in his local community. And he finds out, he knows about Jose Rizal. He knows about the Marcoses of Imelda, of the shoes. He knows about um, Anak, this song, you know, about a Filipino song. But, but more importantly, he was so amazed that I was a filmmaker. He brings me to, he brings me to his house. Because he said he has to drop off or stay first in the city, do some errands. That's before he can go to Brussels airport. So I said, yeah, no, I don't mind. I'll just wait. You know, it's like, think about it. It's like 9 a.m. We get to, 
So I had 12 hours pa. So we get to, ano, around the city, Brussels city, around 12 noon. So like, I had so many hours to kill. I don't mind as long as he's going to bring me to the airport. Okay? So bring him to the airport. And then he brings me, uh, he leaves me and then he says, oh, wait, time out. You don't have any money. Oh, here's, here's, I think, 50 euros. So I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's okay, it's okay. No, 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 it's okay. And here's the, like, tram card, like uh, a card that has the, you know, the bus, wherever you go, you just, or the, we call that, the one that's like a train, but it's in bus a Bus pass? Yeah, bus pass. And they didn't have, they didn't, like, LRT, an open LRT, tram, like that, tram, or anyway. So he gives me that, and he said, no, enjoy Brussels City. Just come back here by 3 o'clock, like that, something like that, or 4 o'clock. So I go enjoy. I enjoy. I ended up in this, in this museum that had a labyrinth. You know what a labyrinth is? Who knows a maze. what? Maze. Yeah, maze. All right. Very wide vocabulary, children, huh? Very good. Very good. All right. So there's a labyrinth, and then I drank a very expensive coffee, and I ate a very expensive steak with my 50, uh, five, uh, 500 years, I don't remember, but I could afford the steak. And then I walked the park, and then I went back to the guy, to Gepetto, and then he brought me to the airport. Just still a two hour ride. So that was my European story. One of my stories in Europe. To be honest, that mm -hmm. could be turned into a movie. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe one, Maybe one day. day. Maybe one day. Uh, did you or someone in your team make the logo for Courageous Compassion? I have to give the credit of the logo of Courageous Compassion, where the credit is due. Um, it's made by the design firm called, at that time, I don't know if at that time it was that, but I knew for sure he owns Dojo, Design of Joey All. So it's a design firm. He's my buddy from college, which we had the same political org in college. And... I helped him win uh, external vice president position. And we and even after that, we've been friends for so long. So he's the one who helps me in, in design concerns. Your life has definitely been full of adventures. That must have been an extremely challenging time in now that thank God for your family is safe. I believe Baron must ask you more about that. Yeah, that's right. It really must have been hard. But it was also another opportunity for courageous compassion. Looking back, what would have you done differently? W which part? In everything? Like one... During the... Oh, the during, during the storm. Ah, maybe, during the or, storm? Maybe in preparations or afterward or during the storm while you're sleeping. I should have already made a, a film. I should have made AVPs. I should have made videos. If I had... Yeah. But I was doing other things. And if... Videos can save a lot of properties and a lot of lives. But I didn't do it. Speaking of... Speaking of courageous compassion, do you work with LGUs or private organizations? Yes, I work with local government units, legislators, barangay captains, um, what else? Uh, mayors, and right now I'm I'm not working with the governor yet. Whoa, that there are so many things that you accomplished, and and so many people that you've helped, and that's so inspiring. Um, if there were any, what were some of the other challenges that you faced 
um like pre storm and post storm if 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 we can ask and even with um working with courageous compassion yes you can ask preston um challenges my main challenge at the end of the day is still like the challenge of so many people it's for me it's less about external challenges and more internal challenges and because external is some but internal challenges in a way that's one thing that you can mature in So my main challenge was I still wanted to do so many things and I still do want to do many things all at the same time. I think that is a challenge, an internal challenge that many human beings face today. I believe I am not the only one. Me too. I I also like to do many things at once. You know, there are parts of me that wish that um, there are more than 24 hours in a day. Exactly. So, so that's my problem. That's the challenge that I have to mitigate, that I have to manage. That is the most, uh, that's the biggest challenge that I have. Everything else external can control it. Let live, let God, let live. You know, let, oh, let, let God let go. Or live and let live na lang. Parang ganun. Yes, you get what I'm saying. All right. You got it, Paul. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, when you're going to get stuff, you sure know how to persevere. But tell us, what keeps you going despite the challenges? Everything works out for the good. of those who love him. That's my main, when I go through challenging times, I just embrace that message. Um, if I may ask, who's the him in, the, in that quote? Yahuwah, Father. Well, thank you for that uh, thing. <laughs> uh, you can do it, Sam. Ah, uh, what? Uh, okay. Um. By the way, I have a bit of a question. Um. Some uh, a comment. Okay. Go. Number four. Uh, about um. Uh, you you sleeping amongst the store. I remember this funny story where, I, that where we were um waiting for a bus, I was tired and I fell asleep standing. <laughs> That, my friend, is talent. And pray, I pray that one day I learn that talent to be able to sleep while standing up. My boy, that is a very valuable skill set that you can teach. I was at the Manila Mall. Really? Waiting for a bus. Really? Standing up. Amazing. You're like a giraffe, brother. <laughs> More of a horse. More of a horse. You don't like the giraffe. Ah? Okay, horse. Like a horse. That's good. That's good. I like that story. And I'm also studying about Jose Rizal and my Filipino. Really? Right now you're studying Jose Rizal? Amazing. Did you know that he was a game developer? Oh. Really? That's cool. He's a game developer. He developed a game in Dinagat Islands. Ah, Dinagat Islands, the Pitan Islands. Sorry, mistake. In the Pitan, because you know Dinagat, the Pitan, they're even in the same Mindanao region. So, yeah, he developed a game. It's actually a very cool game. You get to pick numbers. You get to put, and it's like it's like a complex version of the billiard. Uh, the eight ball. You know the eight ball is no. Like, like, it's a thing that we had in our 
in our time. It's this big, and then you shake it, and then. Oh yeah, I think I know that was invented. I forgot where that. And then was there's invented. like. There's like fortunes. Uh, should I? Or and then there's another version that was made. It's like answers your questions, where you shake it and then something will pop up and then like you, oh, you yeah. ask it. Oh yeah, yes, uh, I you have that one. So I don't it's have something one like I really that. Get one. It's something like that, but ma- in a in a board game. So he had a game like that. So he, he developed a game and he also he also won the lottery. The national lottery. He won second place, and during that time, the lottery had, as part of the deal, they had to hire a band, playing the band, the music and everything, a band, you know, marching and everything, to receive his winnings. And when the boat came with the band and everything, they thought they were being invaded by foreigners. Then they said, "Whoa, no, it's a band." And then why is a band coming here? Oh no, because Jose Rizal won a lottery. So he was in an island so far, far away. And then they brought a band and his winnings because he won second place. That's something. That's a trivia. It's actually true. We look forward to hearing and seeing what's in store for Courageous Compassion. What are your hopes or future goals for the work that they do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Me too. I'm excited. We have this audacious dream right now to build 20,000 20, uh, safe, sustainable, strategic shelter homes for the survivors, shelters for survivors. So I'm focused on that. Plus the club, of course, we're selling. I mean, I want to revive the... There's plans to revive the uh, compassion backpack, but this time for Tacloban. And Actually, I'm studying. I'm studying floods, earthquakes, mm-hmm. of volcanoes and storms in my in my studies. Mm-hmm. Take take it seriously, Philip. Take it very seriously. Uh, speaking of the future, can kids or the youth like us help your cause in any way? If so, how? One, be prepared. Because by preparing, you live. You start living what I'm talking about. What we're about. You get? You're taking what I say seriously. You get? And if you do that, then then you start living it. And then it will get you curious. And then you're going to ask things. And then you're going to find answers. You're going to get more questions. And then you get creative. You'll get creative. And then when you get creative, with that compassion planted in your hearts or being worn as a backpack. You that's when you how you guys can because you guys are smart. You guys are hands down a very equipped energized generation. Right? And it's not just about our generation, it's about all the generations. We gotta be prepared. Because every time in, in, in the Bible, you guys believe the Bible, right? Or you read the Bible at least. Okay, in the Bible, every time there's there's pestilence or plague. You hear these words? You know these words? There's a new, there's a new word for these words. You know what it's called? The new word for pestilence and plague. COVID. Pandemic. 
Uh. Tama? Right? Right? Uh. Right? It's pandemic. A plague and a pestilence, that's how the big words from the Bible, but really, it's also just a pandemic. So what's happening now is, you know, happened already before and much, much worse. Right? But every time there's a quote-unquote pandemic, a global pandemic, famine comes. Famine. You know what a famine is, right? Food shortage. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, oh yes, I was just going to say, you know, uh, there's lots of causes for a food shortage. Yeah, so since everything is not happening smoothly in the world, you know, the ships are not coming on time, the farmers are not coming on time because some of the farmers are getting affected by climate. And some of the, you know, and then delays in trains, in factories, and you no. Know, but the demand for food is just increasing and increasing and increasing. You get? And if there's no improvement in food production, then the resources will disappear, will get scarcer or less and less. Yeah, about so, the famine. Mm, go. Go, uh, you know, I sometimes you experience that that when they when mama still when we're waiting for food. Exactly. And for a very long time, there's a shortage of food. Yeah. And, and that sucks, hard. right? And that sucks. Right? That sucks. And and but the reality that some of the people or a lot of the world will face is that happening constantly, but not for a few hours. But sometimes for days, they will go without food. That's the reality of the future that we can see. That I see. It's not to scare I... people. You get? I'm not here. I'm not, I don't want to get people scared. I just want them to be prepared. If you're prepared, you can sleep like me, like a baby, you know? And still come out golden. That really sounds like a real a nice future that our me we us we here in Saudi Arabia want really want to happen. I believe Philip has a question too. Go, Philip. I've learned that there are ongoing recovery and restoration projects in Dinagat Islands. What is the current situation in Dinagat now? So our team on the ground while I was here has already built the prototype for the 20,000 um, shelters that we're going to build for the survivors. So this is kind of bold, kind of gutsy, because one, we don't have the money for it yet. And two, you know, uh, it's a broken city. It's hard to construct. It's hard to build in a broken city. So, and at the same time, nobody has really done that much in the Philippines for that fast. Yet. So, hopefully we do well. And that's one of the major plans. It's a, one of the major things that's happening. Um, the reality is, you know, more than that are the people that have no zero shelter. When I say zero shelter, I mean they have... It's not even a shelter. You can't call a tent a shelter. See, they, they, they have temporary shelters. What do they do? They found pieces of the ceiling, pieces of the walls, pieces of the roof, got some tarpaulins and started building, you know, little tents. So it's right now at almost like, uh, I'd say, 90, no, no, 80%. It's like a tent city. It's like a upcycled Tent city. A refugee camp? Huh? A refugee camp. Hindi naman, kasi a refugee, you're strangers. Ito naman, you're with your community. You're with your people. And there's no oppression in the sense that, you know, you're, you have no rights. You get, but rights here, it's like secondary because people don't have food. People don't have shelter. People don't have access to water. So, 
but we're we're doing the best that we can. Like I can say one of the things that we were able to do immediately was set up water systems. I said there are rivers and lakes and you know sources of water, and if you just put water pumps electrified, then you can serve the people. You get so so, but right now there. Um, I don't want to talk about the negative things. I just really want to talk about the plan. So right now, did I tell you that I was planting? Who can guess how many trees I planted? Our team planted during the lockdown. Who can remember? 10,000? Yes, 10,000. So imagine everything in the 10 hectares was destroyed. Our buildings, our offices, our tables, our chairs, our files, everything was destroyed. All the plants were destroyed. All the electrical posts were destroyed. Everything was destroyed. But the coconut trees we planted were standing. They weren't touched by, I mean, they were touched by the storm, but they were still standing. Everything else was destroyed. The coconut trees that we planted in a post-mining site where there used to be mining was standing tall. And that harvests every three years. Did you know that one of the craze right now is coconut cider. Like the Americans are like buying so much coconut cider. You know what it is? It's just coconut vinegar. Suka. Right? So anyway, so did I answer the question? Sorry. My mind is so I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah, but um uh, about the coconuts, I, I um I saw a short thing that says if you eat too many Coconuts, you'll get very fat. So, uh, be careful. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you can see my face. My problem is not fat. I need more fat. Just be careful, you know. All right, Sam. All right, Sam. I oh. gotcha. What else did you read about coconuts? No, no this is a song I heard. <laughs> It's a song that you heard about coconuts? It might be right. really now. All right, all right. Okay. Is there any way that we or the people watching this video can help your cause? Please share how yes. people can contact you or if you collaborate or donate. All right. Um, go to Taklob in Facebook. Do you guys have Facebook? You're allowed Facebook, no? I don't have. You don't have. All right. Maybe you can help set us. What, what kind of what account of social media are you allowed? All right. Taklob.ph. Yeah, yeah. Taklob. It's about luggages and bags. Hmm. Bag, 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 All right. So that's. They can message us there, or they can also. Uh, contact us at still Facebook, Courageous Compassion. Another option is that um, our viewers could also um, contact us. We also yeah. have a Facebook page, um, The Divergence Facebook. Contact, the Divergence. contact us and we'll be happy to relay your message to jo um, Mr. Jordan. Here. Go ahead, go ahead. Good, please, please do, please do. And I believe, yeah, that's um, it. About your story, I really liked, I really loved a sp a sp more specifically to describe my feeling more. I really loved how hard you worked with those coconut trees. And like that feeling of after the storm, you see everything destroyed, but then you see those coconut trees that you planted with your sweat and blood, kind of just like, they're they're just staying there and it it's like your uh how do you say your labor has come to fruition and and shows that it and proves that it could also like stand against any storm so like that's really um amazing example of perseverance 
Actually, I, I really like building, so maybe when I'm older, I can build something to help people prepare for storms and other dangerous things. Good, Philip. Good. That's good. And, um, yeah, me too. I also loved how um, one of you, you made your passion. Um, like, you weren't satisfied with your passion, so you, you, you added pa since you weren't content with it, you, you need compassion. And that, that was one of the... Um, my main takeaways from what you said and good, good. um yeah it turned turned into courageous compassion since um of course you have compassion but you also need the courage to act upon it you know and um we as well are also planning to raise funds for typhoon odette victims by um selling shirts here here in Jeddah, mm-hmm. saudi arabia and uh however it's still in process but we will keep you updated paul so um thank okay. you very much mr sebastian uh for joining us here today. May your work continue to bless the lives of others. Thank you, for. Thank you, for. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. You.